am i audible yes ma'am yes, ma and the material is visible both you can say yes yes hello yes it is visible ma'am yes ma'am you are audible and visible uh, am i audible yes, yes ma'am ma yes yeah. okay okay so uh, good evening all of you so today we'll start with our next unit that is atomic absorption spectrophotometry uh, last class we discussed about uh, flame photometry then atomic which is also a part of atomic spectroscopy okay and uh, uh, atomic fluorescence spectroscopy also we discussed elaborately so today we will be discussing the atomic absorption spectrophotometry you people should listen it very carefully because those who have missed my class during ev visible spectroscopy that is the uh, part where absorption spectroscopy belongs to so that part if you missed it then you can understand very well if you are going through this unit also the atomic absorption spectrophotometry because these are the some parts which you have not ever studied during your plus 2 and plus 3 so it is little difficult but if you are following my all classes then by this time by the ninth unit you would have all clear about the spectroscopic parts uh, because we started with the uh, interaction of your radiation as well as matter then we discussed about your Uh, easy visible spectroscopy that is coming uh, with that it is uh, absorption spectroscopy then fluorescence phosphorescence then slowly we move to your uh, applications of all that spectroscopies then ir spectroscopy also we discussed then we move to atomic spectroscopy by leaving behind your molecular spectroscopy then atomic spectroscopy we started with the flame photometry which we discussed in the last class then atomic fluorescence spectroscopy also we discussed but if you see the principle okay if you see the principle then more or less it is the principle is same for all the spectroscopy but the instrumentation technique and the monochromator or filter adjustment or that parts may be different but all are based on the principle of light and matter interaction and as i was telling you in the last class if a light is falling on matter then it is absorbing some energy it is absorbing some energy means what will happen there must be some change that some change we are saying that some change what is that some change it may be rotation it may be vibration it may be some transition from uh, uh, your uh, electronic state to another electronic state then followed by emission of some radiative uh, emission non radiative emission so many processes are there so spectroscopy is not so simple as we are reading in theory practically if you do then this general protocols also may vary from spectroscopy to spectroscopy okay so this is the general idea i was just summarizing uh, before going moving to this part of the unit so i think all of you are clear with the spectroscopic parts and then let us move to the atomic spectrometry here we are just going to discuss atomic absorption spectroscopy you can think of your ev visible spectroscopy when we were dealing with the molecular uh, spectroscopy molecular uh, ev visible spectrophotometry here we will start with the atomic absorption spectroscopy okay so let's see what is happening here how you can record this 
and whether beer lambert's law what we studied in the molecular absorption spectroscopy here it is valid or not how to quant uh, do the quantitative analysis everything here we can see what should be the source of measurement what should be the monochromator filter all these things you can very well understand if you are going through this particular part of uh, this particular unit okay so let's move slowly i will tell you the principle and everything again and again i told you that why i am using this material instead of uh, doing any other ppts or so because it is available with all of you you don't have to depend on me for my slides my slides if i am doing i will do of my own interest and how it will be convenient to me but if i am uh, uh, this material is already available to you you don't have to depend on anyone but you need to understand and have a tuning particular tuning with me that what i am saying and one by one you can understand it very well so uh, but but you have to uh, do a thing that you have to download the materials and as i was telling you already that uh, particularly if i say about the spectroscopic method a uh, chapter uh, spectroscopic method that uh, topic then in this igno material is quite enough everything in detail like uh, if see you have learned all these wordings will be there like someone is trying to make you understand about the topic type so this is self sufficient for all of you as far as your learning purpose is concerned as far as your uh, uh, this uh, examination point of view also it is enough and uh, as i was telling you one day also i was showing you the spectrophotometer which is available in my laboratory how to util uh, how to take the spectrum also i so new i have so new that so this research also Uh, this uh, material is also enough to have a particular understanding towards the research point of view also if you are moving further higher study or doing a research okay so okay let's move with the uh, part of this uh, study atomic absorption spectroscopy so in the last class what we saw that for flame photometry or we studied atomic emission spectroscopy the elements that are present in the sample what we did we have converted into a gaseous atoms okay by a process called atomization whenever i am saying you just try to correlate my previous class okay uh, so we ha- we are doing the atomization first then their interaction with the radiation happened so last that unit uh, 7 and 8 whatever we studied about the flame photometry and atomic fluorescence spectrometry to summarize in this way i just want to say you that in flame photometry we measure the emission of radiation by thermally excited atoms whereas in fluorescence atomic spectrometry we monitor the fluorescence emission from the radiationally excited atoms if you remember my uh, fluorescence spectroscopy class then see we are if we are saying atomic emission spectroscopy and atomic fluorescence spectroscopy atomic fluorescence spectroscopy is also a part of atomic emission spectroscopy however if you remember the jablonski diagram we explained it very carefully that when a molecular transition radiative transition is happening from the lower singlet excited state to the lower singlet uh, ground state that's what that radiative process we say it to be fluorescence spectrophotometry okay so in this unit we'll discuss about atomic absorption spectrometry okay so basically that concerns the absorption of radiation by the atomized analyte element in the ground state we are dealing with the absorption part only you, you must focus on this point we are talking about absorption point only 
further it is getting relaxed and the radiative emission all that things we are not talking about uh, that part in this particular unit subsequently we will see in the next units okay so the atomization is achieved by thermal energy of the flame or electrothermally in an electrical furnace so the wavelengths of the radiation observed and the extent of absorption from the basis of the qualitative quantitative determinations respectively so from by using the wavelength of radiation that is getting absorbed you can indirectly calculate the concentration of the analyte you want to study by using the Beer Lambert's law. How we will be doing that? Subsequent sections we will see and we will try to understand that part clearly. So, this atomic absorption method using flames are very rapid and very precise and are applicable to about 67 elements. I was telling you in the last class that flame photometry and this atomic spectroscopy is very very helpful for studying your alkaline and alkali earth metals so th that points you should understand how we are going to analyze these elements so electrothermal methods of the analysis on the other hand are slower and are less precise however these are more sensitive and need much smaller samples so quantity of samples here you need is very less so that is also a, a point uh, to be noted over here and as the absorption of resonance radiation is highly selective and very sensitive the technique of AAS that is atomic absorption spectroscopy has become a powerful method of analysis last time i was telling you about the selectivity and sensitivity these two matters a lot when you are doing any spectroscopic analysis okay because uh, suppose same element suppose arsenic you can study through atomic absorption spectrophotometry then uh, atomic fluorescence spectroscopy you can study but how the selectivity and sensitivity matters here up to which scale, up to which PPB unit or uh, PPM unit, up to how much extent you can sense, that matters a lot. Okay, if your water is contaminated with some arsenic, but you can sense through a particular spectroscopy to like little bit amount also you can sense, then its sensitivity is good enough to study that amount. But all spectroscopic tools, you can't study that less amount of your analyte also so that is how your spectroscopy methods also vary to uh, study a particular analyte okay so um, the trace metal elements determination also you do in analytical laboratories and this is the most application part of your AAS which will go one by one let's come to the principle of atomic absorption spectrophotometry okay first we will see what is its principle so in atomic absorption spectrometry the atomization is preferred by aspirating the sample solution into flame if you correlate the principles of all spectroscopies in the beginning what we discussed is the normal absorption spectroscopy, then emission fluorescence and UVB fluorescence and phosphorescence and IR spectroscopy. That time I was telling you about the molecular nature also, how the molecular nature should be. So in some spectroscopies we discussed it should have a, a di dipole moment, in some that should be oscillating dipole moment and in some that should be a rigidity of the molecular structure and conjugation in case, in case of your fluorescence and uh, phosphorescence uh, part. Then apart from that, we also studied the selection rules. What should be the selection rule for IR spectroscopy, for uh, fluorescence, as well as for phosphorescence and the UV visible part. That also we studied. But here, when you are moving to the atomic absorption part, 
here you are just dealing with the gaseous atoms and you are going to make use of the flame or electrothermally you want you have to atomize the atomization you have to do for that gaseous uh, sample uh, you have to even if it is in solution phase you have to make it in the vapor phase do the atomization then put a radiation to it then only your absorption and excitation will happen that is what we studied in the our previous class okay so uh, coming to this uh, principal part so the atomization is performed by aspirating the sample solution into a flame where the analyte element is converted into gaseous phase atoms as i was telling uh, just now then alternatively the sample is fed into a graphite furnace okay where the atomization is achieved electrothermally also see here two methods are there by using flame you can do atomization also alternatively you can use graphite furnace where uh, the atomization is achieved electrothermally at relatively low temperature also subsequently i will explain you the advantages and disadvantages of this flame uh, method as well as graphite furnace method by the, the by the end of this class you will be very clear so don't worry and uh, as the temperature of this atomization is low so most of the atoms remain in the ground state which is which can absorb characteristic radiation from the radiation source and made from the analyte element here i want to make a point clear to all of you in the last uh, classes when uh, while discussing the boltzmann distribution if you remember so the atoms in the ground state this is a very important point if i am having 100 molecules or 100 molecular spectroscopy while discussing 100 molecules here suppose 100 atoms in the ground state if i am having 80 atoms in the ground state but while getting the intensity while getting the spectrum i will go i will get a good intense spectrum where there is 100 atoms in the ground state okay that we can observe very well but if the temperature thermal energy is more then out of that 100 atoms in the ground state if 20 is already getting excited thermally then i will get the uh, spectrum from uh, out of the 80 uh, atoms so my intensity will go down so in order to make it more sensitive it is better if you are dealing with the low temperature part and there is no thermal energy it is not absorbing and it is not going out so that you can monitor it you can quantify it very clearly and uh, very precisely so subsequently we will see how we are going to do that okay
हेलो ओ सॉरी suddenly when i was asking some question then only i realized that uh, uh, its net is gone for the first time it happened right for the first time actually it happened like this where i was when you all people uh, listen to me yes ma'am yes ma'am ah uh, Ah, uh, just tell me last uh, where I I was. Oh, when you listen to me, this uh, concentration dependent absorbance was over. Yes, ma'am. Okay, this was over then. Okay, fine. No. No. No, ma'am. Principle of atomic absorption spectrometry. A principle of atomic absorption. You were uh, talking about the comparison of uh, Boltzmann distribution in each each of the spectroscopy. Okay, okay, okay. It's full only, madam. Hmm. So Boltzmann distribution concentration is yes, this this uh, here only here only. Okay. So not missed much. So here we can focus on. Sorry, I didn't realize. all of you might be knowing when i am entering starting the class continuously i just move with that to finish your thing i, I didn't realize i have disconnected from there for the first time it happened okay fine so let's move to the concentration dependence of absorbance uh, we have already studied that uh, absorption spectroscopy where bear lambert's law we had already discussed okay so here this uh, mathematical expression of bear lambert's law here also for the atomic absorption spectrometry we are going to follow this bear lambert's law okay but here one thing you must notice that typical absorbance should be 0.1 to 0.3 you might be seeing uh, some uh, absorbance is going beyond 0.3 but as far as research is concerned you can't take the absorbance reading above 0.3 that is not valid one that is due to some uh, error that is uh, in between occurring okay but 0.1 to 0.3 is the acceptable absorbance value it should not go beyond that so here absorbance and concentration is both uh, uh, directly proportional which is a very good technique to do the quantitative analysis but quantitative methodology if you see a is is not a absolute analysis method okay it is not a absolute analysis method as i was telling you there is not a single method which is absolutely valid for all the elements or all kind of samples that is why you are having different methodologies that is why you are having different methodologies sometimes it may happen you have to do trial and error with some uh, uh, trial and error with uh, certain samples or certain analytes you want to study this calibration plot method in the last class also we saw this one in this method what you are going to do as uh, all of a sudden you can't use a uh, analyte and uh, go for the absorption study and you will be getting some absorption you can find out its concentration no in an indirect way you have to take the absorbance of a known sample take a calibration part do a calibration plot with it okay then only you can take further the analyte uh, absorption then you can extrapolate it to get the actual concentration so basically a calibration plot is drawn by aspirating standard solutions of known concentration into the flame okay known solution you are taking then you are doing the atomization using the flame 
then measuring the absorbance for each solution okay so the concentration of unknown solution is then determined then do from the calibration plot so i think you got my point you are taking a standard solution may uh, just uh, uh, just doing the atomization then taking the absorbance okay and making a standard calibration plot by using that calibration plot in second stage what you can do take a unknown solution of the analyte okay and get the absorbance of that analyte then by using the calibration plot you can determine the concentration of the unknown analyte so this is what is the thing but in practice a single calibration plot doesn't serve the purpose single calibration plot if you are doing that will not help you much we need to take three four standard solutions and we should do three four standard calibration plot to cross check whether your analyte you are going to study through this method is good enough uh, you are using this standard calibration plots are good enough for you are getting a good or proper way of uh, getting the concentration of the unknown analyte so by taking a single calibration will not help you much then uh, internal standard method is also there so in this method what we do a fixed amount of an internal standard which is chemically similar to the analyte means now you are not taking completely chemically different analyte uh, uh, standard solution now you are going to do what do, uh, going to do that which is chemically similar to your analyte that chemical moiety you are going to take then you are doing a standard calibration plot with that because you want an accurate result as i was telling you for increasing the sensitivity and selectivity most of the time we do we tune various things so accordingly here what we are doing in the internal standard method we are just taking a, a chemical which is chemically similar to the analyte being determined and observes at the similar wavelength is added to the standard solution and the test sample okay then the intensity ratio of the analyte and internal standard is plotted as a function of the analyte concentration in the standard solution for example here you see for while determining sodium or potassium in blood serum yeah, in blood serum if you want to determine sodium and potassium lithium is used as the internal standard so a typical plot obtained in the atomic absorption spectroscopic determination using a standard method has been given here what you are going to do absorbance of the analyte divided by absorbance of the standard you are going to plot against the concentration of analyte okay so this is the standard calibration plot by internal standard method you have to follow okay then another is there this is standard addition method what you, you are doing here standard addition method in this method is specifically applicable when the signal is altered by the sample matrix standard addition method means some uh, error is happening but you want to get a uh, concentration of the you want to know the analyte concentration some signal problem is also there due to the sample spreading sample matrix then what you will do so there are various things it, it can happen while measuring the spectrum while taking the spectrum so in this method 
a known amount of the standard solution of known increasing concentrations of the analyte is added to a number of aculates uh, of the sample solution. So the resulting solutions are diluted to make uh, to uh, the same final volume and the observance is made, made. Then you have to plot a graph. Graph is shown over, over here, observance versus concentration of the analyte. Graph is drawn between that and it is then extrapolated. Here you can see the extrapolation has been done to the concentration axis, okay, to obtain the concentration of the sample solution. If the plot is nonlinear, sometimes it may happen that you are going to get nonlinear plot, then the extrapolation is not possible. When you will get nonlinear non thing? I was telling you in the UV visible spectroscopy class that if your concentration is very, very high, the solution concentration is very, very high, then the solution itself will act as the inner filter, okay, then it will interfere with the prop getting proper observance or getting proper signal. That time you will get nonlinear, uh, nonlinearity will get this observance spectrum. But here I want to make you, I want to remind you that that is why this BL numbers law is not applicable to the concentrated solutions. This is the limitation with the BL numbers law. It is applicable to the dilute solutions only. And second point to the limitation is the light should be monochromatic. If you remember your uh, uh, which class I, I can't say graduation because in graduation also you have studied this or not, I don't remember. But it is applicable to your dilute solutions and monochromatic radiation. If you are taking concentrated solution, then this adjustment spectroscopic method will not help you much. So this AAS is a promising analytical method uh, that is extensively employed for your quantitative determinations of different uh, elements in wide range of samples. But a major disadvantage of AAS measurement is that only a single element can be determined at a time as a separate radiation source is required for each element. For each element, for a single element, you can use this AS at a single time. I have seen this AS instrument. Okay, this is like for measuring a single element, you have to like uh, put your sweat like anything. You have to make your sample compartments ready, nitrogen purging, oxygen purging, or whatever you want to do. And the source that you are going to use, radiation source for a single element, you have to use a single source. For different elements, you have to choose different source. And while purchasing this AS, AS instrument, okay, if you are going for more uh, radiation sources, then it will cost you more. So it is not so easy of getting this. If you are taking for one or two elements, maybe it is it is coming around 40 lakh or 45 lakh. For multi-element determination also it is helpful, but it needs more multi-sources, okay? See, here question is, what is the importance of calibration plot? So you need to do it. As I was telling you, in all the materials, you are having SAQs, and before that, he will be answered to it. It has been made in a nice way, this uh, material. So coming to the instrumentation of this atomic absorption spectrophotometry, like the way 
this is the ninth unit up to eighth unit you have already seen wherever the instrumentation part is coming there will be some radiation source it may vary from spectroscopic method to spectroscopic method an atom reservoir will be there then one monochromator will be there then detector and readout device this is the protocol type for all the spectroscopies but this source varies from spectroscopic method to spectroscopic method here atomic spectroscopies your atom reservoir thing is coming however if you recall the molecular spectroscopy there it was your sample holder or your sample compartment was there then monochromator is there then detector and output device so this is the thing see this wavelength selector is this can be your monochromator sometimes before that also we put filters depending on the which uh, wavelength region radiation we want okay so that also is crucial for you to uh, note down so here what one by one we'll see what is this radiation source what is this atomic reservoir everything we'll discuss in detail because uh, if you see your four units four units are based on your uh, this technique only if you can't understand this unit then it will be very difficult to understand the subsequent units as well as the before unit that is atomic uh, emission spectroscopy and fluorescent spectroscopy because here is the main thing which is happening atomic absorption so coming to the radiation source so all commercially available your atomic absorption spectrometers use a radiation source that emits the characteristic spectrum of the element to be determined the source is very very important here for the atomic absorption spectrophotometer you have to choose the source according to the element which you want to determine in your water sample or in your uh, some different sample you have to see it in your soil sample before atomization you need to choose the radiation source the essential requirement of the radiation source is that it gives a constant and intense output okay it gives a constant and instant output so generally two type of sources are we can use one is line sources one is continuum sources okay so initially the continuum sources were used and primary radiation required was isolated with a high resolution monochromator initially uh, the instruments were having the continuum sources okay however there is some demerit with this continuum sources these had low radiant densities and didn't uh, provide sufficiently high sensitivity since it is having low radiant uh, densities with the radiation so what happen your sensitivity also will go down so nowadays what happen nowadays mostly line sources are getting used line sources which is very intense instead of your continuum sources line sources are very intense and to the point and precise okay so nowadays the hollow cathode lamp belonging to the fast type that is line sources has been mostly used okay and the electroless discharge lamps is another line source are also frequently employed for the purpose in fact these are superior for the elements such as arsenic selenium tellurium okay with low melting point the elements which are having low melting point they require low 
less temperature then you can handle it very carefully with these lime sources so this hcl and edl are very important component of your atomic spectrofluorescence uh, spectrophotometry too okay so then coming to the atomizer then after the radiation you are having atomizer so how many type of atomizer are there we will see it in detail just let me take some water thank you so the purpose of this atomizer is to provide a representative portion of the analyte in the optical path so before moving to the optical path the analyte which you want to study you have to make it uh, convert into a gaseous atom okay and convert into a free neutral ground state atoms then only you can go for the further studies in atomic absorption spectrophotometry the flames and furnaces that generate a temperature in the range of your 1500 to 3000 degree centigrade are most common methods of atomization okay so the two common type of atomizers used for generating atomic species are in the vapor phase are flame atomizer and electrothermal you must note it down one is flame uh, atomizer another is electrothermal atomizer this flame atomizers are having many disadvantages that is why further when a research was done uh, just to do the atomic AAs in a better way then uh, scientists move for the uh, electrothermal atomizers okay so first we'll see what is flame atomizer and what is its merits as well as demerits till now you have heard about flame atomizer a lot but now also you will see the electrothermal atomizer also so in a typical flame atomization process the analyte solutions are generally nobilized with the help of nobilizer this term is not new to you nobilizer we had already seen it into a spray chamber okay the aerosol so produced along with a mixture of a burning gas and uh, an oxidant is directed into a suitable burner as already described in your previous unit the flame temperature depend on fuel oxidant ratio see if you are having fuel you, there should be oxidant also okay and flame temperature depend on that so fuel oxidant ratio is very very important as far as this flame atomizer is concerned so fuel oxidant combinations commonly used in AAS and the corresponding combustion reactions and the flame temperature are given in this table okay so this is the fuel oxidant ah, one more thing I just want to remind you during our plus twos we have read fuel cell do you remember in electrochemistry fuel cell there is fuel and there is also oxidant otherwise how the combustion will happen and how the flame uh, will come out of that and how the flame temperature you have to maintain see many uh, methods are there but here as we discussed that in a you have to take a thing which will be maintained within 1500 to 3000 degrees centigrade it should not go beyond that or it is in kelvin it is in kelvin and here it is mentioned in degree centigrade 
then we must cross check this thing okay so there is some error we must cross check this thing later on we can do that but uh, if it is uh, degree centigrade or k or that is k whatever it may be it is will cross check later on but it has to be 1500 to 3000 okay then it is a better fuel oxidant mixture for us to be studied so uh, here you are having in the flame uh, atomizer you are having burner also burners will be getting used here two major type of nobilizer burners used in AS are premix nobilizer burner system and total conjunction burner okay so uh, in premix type burner what happen the liquid is sprayed into a mixing chamber in the flame photometry chapter while discussing we are discussing about the spraying of the uh, sp uh, liquid is getting sprayed into the mix chamber or nobilizer where the droplets are mixed with the conjunction with the combustion gas so droplets are coming in contact with the combustion gas there and are sent to the burner okay on the other hand in the total conjunction burner the nobilizer and the burner are combined this is also called turbulent flow burner we'll be seeing its figure also in the down section so several factors are involved in the choice of this burner that is also a point c while discussing uh, the flame photometry or while discussing a certain spectroscopic method we are simply saying that okay this is the radiation source then it is getting uh, we are just making it to fall on the sample then some excitation is happening then some radiation is coming out we are scanning it through some spectroscopic techniques so this is the normal thing for all the spectroscopic method but till now you have you might have realized that every point we are seeing there is certain things to understand if you are taking a source if you are just here simple burner you want to use then also you are having tension whether to use this premix nobilizer burner or total conjunction burner then again from uh, there are several factors to choose and uh, choice a burner then atomizer also whether to use flame atomizer or electrothermal atomizer so that everything comes through subsequent research that is why the research is never ending and if something is getting devised it is, it is again getting reflected in theories and in textbooks okay so how the it is getting done through subsequent experiments you have to do trial and errors you have to do many experiments then only you can say okay this is what is happening if you are asking me that this is how this is thing that is not the thing okay that may also happen but you have to practically do the experiment for get, getting a clear, a clear about a particular thing. But in generalized way, we can discuss in theories. So a uh, premix burner is preferred for atomic absorption work, except when a high burning velocity flame must be used. Turbulent flow burners are widely used for atomic emission measurements about which we will just discuss subsequently. So this is a pre-mix nobilizer burner used in AS. Here you see here sample is there in a beaker. Okay, here sample is there. So uh, you are just spraying that sample through the sample inlet. So it is going inside the 
mixing chamber who whatever is not getting used that is coming through uh, this drain it is getting uh, uh, drained out okay so this mixing chamber is there then it is going to the burner head then it, you are this is getting atomized or it is coming in contact of your flame but these flames are not ideal atomizers as for a number of element the atomization is not quantitative atomization is not quantitative because just imagine this is not ideal atomizer how much it is going into it quantitatively it is not precise uh, the sensitivity is lower considerably due to this and by dilution of the analyte atom population with gases in the flame so here some points has been marked what are the disadvantages with the flame atomization only about 10% of the nobilized sample reaches the flame here in mixing chamber if you see out of the most of the solution mostly it will be coming draining out and 10% of the nobilized uh, sample reaches the flame and it is taken for the then for the diluted by the fuel and oxidant gases so that the test material has very small concentration in the flame then further so its sensitivity will go down if your concentration of your sample which you want to study is getting down then obviously intensity wise also it will get affected so again you have to do it tune with the taking standard calibration plots and standard solution you have to do that okay so a minimum sample volume of 0.5 to 1 ml is needed uh, to uh, give a reliable measurement then subsequently what you are doing if your sample sensitivity sorry measurement sensitivity atomizer itself which you are taking in the beginning if its sensitivity is getting down you have to take in order to increase the sensitivity so more number of sample you have to take so about 0.5 to 1 ml of the solution you, you have to take to get a reliable measurement don't get surprised by seeing 0.5 to 1 ml you will be seeing oh this is also very less no 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 in spectroscopic methods in absorption spectroscopy uh, the instrument i was showing you fluorimeter i was showing you that day which is available in my lab we use micromolar micromolar can you imagine micromolar concentration of the solution very less quantity also you can take to get the spectrum so that is not the point for the point is since its sensitivity is getting down from the beginning itself uh, as i was telling you population matters a lot in the spectroscopic methods so you have to uh, use minimum sample of this much to get a reliable measurement so third point is the viscous samples such as blood serum oils etc require dilution with the solvent since the data are viscous it is very difficult it will be very difficult to handle them you need to dilute it with uh, your solvents okay so uh, these problems with the flame atomizer is we uh, we can avoid by taking some non flame methods by taking some non flame methods how will do by electrically heating the thing or the thing uh, i was discussing electrothermal atomization you have to follow okay so that also subsequently we will discuss electrothermal atomization technique how we can do that but then you are uh, monochromator is coming into picture that we already know 
from our previous uh, chapters also that what is that monochromatory is the monochromator are devices that can selectively provide the radiation in spectroscopy these two words you will be using it again and again selective and sensitive in order to increase the sensitivity to get a better signal to noise ratio you have to tune the spectroscopic methods in various ways not even in general uh, how much you are going to get you have to tune even in between okay similarly uh, monochromatic radiation as i was telling you for absorption spectrophotometry to follow the bl lambert's law uh, very uh, clearly if you want to follow the bl lambert's law then diluted solution should be diluted and you should have a monochromatic radiation so uh, this monochromator are your devices that can selectively provide the radiation of a desired wavelength out of the range of wavelengths that are emitted by the source source will emit uh, various range wavelengths by putting the monochromator you have to do it in a selective manner in this the monochromators select a given emission line and isolate it from other lines due to the molecular band emissions and all non absorbed lines there is also error everywhere so here also you will be uh, getting many non absorbed lines some molecular band emissions if some uh, some sort of atomization is not getting done properly so out of that also you may get but by putting the monochromator you can cut you can eliminate that parts and ha huh, one more thing i want to tell you why seeing the monochromator don't think the monochromator is same for all the techniques no technique to technique it also varies so there are various things Uh, about the monochromators also, but for the time being, you must know there is a monochromator which you are, uh, which is will provide you the selective radiation. Okay, and this most commercial AS instruments will have your grating monochromators. Grating mon monochromators will converge the radiations falling on that, and uh, it will have a, give a intense. monochromatic radiation so that is the best way and detector as the wavelengths of radius uh, resonance lines fall in the uv visible region we are dealing with atomic absorption spectroscopy so remember that okay the most commonly used detector in as is your photomultiplier tube again and again we had discussed about the photomultiplier tube it will enhance your uh, uh, it will enhance the uh, amplify the signal what uh, whatever you are going to get through your thing then your readout re device will be there and uh, this uh, readout systems include meters chart recorders display units or display meters but nowadays the microprocessor controlled systems are also commercially available okay so here you see the question line sources whatever line sources you are using then graphite furnace atomic absorption spectrometer i was uh, telling you atomization we are using two ways we can use two ways one is flame atomization uh, another is electrothermal or uh, electrothermal i will do through this furnace techniques you have to do so here we are moving with the graphite furnace atomization absorption spectrophotometry which is better than the flame uh, where we are using atomizer as the flame okay so the flame atomization method suffers from some drawbacks the drawbacks already we had discussed there were three points in that drawbacks so in order to overcome these problems 
of the some flameless methods of AS has been developed. So two type of flameless atomizer are generally used. These are graphite tube furnace or elbow furnace we say then and the carbon rod or filament uh, atomizer also we use. So AS using graphite furnace is called graphite furnace atomic absorption spectrometry GFAS which is highly sensitive 100 to 1000 uh, times as compared to the flame AS just imagine how sensitive it is if it is sensitive um, like 100 to 1000 times then you can take a less concentration of the analyte over here. You can take less concentration of analyte or else you can put it in this way that if you want to study some sample where your contamination of that analyte is there but contamination is to less extent means that analyte is present in the less amount that is why it is contaminated though it is contaminated you are not able to detect it some other methods so you can use here because it is uh, hundred to uh, thousand times uh, more sensitive as compared to the flame maze so mostly you are going to detect the elements in alkali alkaline earth metal elements you are going to detect in any sample you want to study so and it requires a very uh, small sample size also okay so it has a further advantage of not requiring any sample preparation sample preparation is not needed here okay so so much so that solid samples do not require sample dissolution also and let us uh, learn about this uh, flameless method of studying okay so the basic principle of flameless is is similar to flame is the basic principle is same the analyte is converted into vaporized atoms here also in the ground state that are subjected to the characteristic resonance radiation emitted by a line source then the absorption of radiation and its extent form the basis of your analytical applications. So the basic principle for your flame uh, of uh, photometry or for the atomic absorption spectrometry where others, uh, but other source you are using, flame source you are using is almost same as, um, as you are seeing for the GFAS okay the only thing here is changes your atomizer process is different as regards the instrumental aspects the two techniques are similar to a good extent and the difference being in the atomizer and the atom reservoir only difference between AS and GFAS is this so rest of the components of the instrument are the same. However, a faster electronics is required to process the rapidly obtained transient signal in your GFAS. Okay, so let us see how this electrothermal atomizer works, which is a flameless. So how it works, let us see, uh, let us study it in detail. A, here it is mentioned 1000 K to uh, 3000 K. Okay, so just rectify over there where it was written your uh, degree centigrade. Otherwise, rest of the parts it is written uh, in Kelvin only. So, uh, there uh, I want to say here that everywhere there can be mistake. Even if it is a small material, even if I am telling you something, but always as a student, you must grasp the positive things. You must 
take the note on the right things. If in material it is written K and you just cross checking with the subsequent things, everywhere it is written in Kelvin, but at some point it is in degree centigrade, you need to verify that. Okay, okay fine. So in electrothermal layers, the graphite or metallic tube or cup furnaces undergoes resistive heating to attain the temperatures required for complete atomization of the analyte. Okay. For volatile elements, this can be accomplished at the temperatures of 1000 K. If it is a volatile element, you don't need much temperature. So 1000 K is also enough for the atomization. Uh, then whereas for more refractory elements, the temperature should be up to 3000 K. Okay. So what is the working principle of this graphite furnace as an atomizer, which is a flameless. So here you will not have a flame. So a graphite furnace consists of a hollow graphite cylinder here I am showing you down so that you can understand by seeing the figure also so it consists of a hollow graphite cylinder okay having a length of about 5 centimeter why length is very important because if you correlate your absorbance you are seeing right Absorbance means your length and concentration is very, very important. And diameter of about 1 centimeter. Okay. Then the tube is surrounded by a metal jacket. The tube is surrounded by a metal jacket through which water is circulated. Okay. So here you are having metal jacket and water outlet is there then water inlet is in the top side okay then uh, where i was okay the tube is surrounded by metal jacket through which water is circulated and remains separated from the tube by a gas space where an inert gas such as argon or nitrogen is circulated as shown in the uh, figure okay so you are telling you are just gas purging is there as i was telling you while seeing the as instrument while measuring that you need your nitrogen gas uh, purging oxygen cylinder also you need because you are uh, if you are you are going to add as the uh, fuel and oxidant in the fuel atomizer you need that time Okay, but here for the graphite furnace technique, you don't need any oxidant and flame like that. So you can uh, electrothermally, you can attain everything. So a small amount of the analyte solution, you see here the concentration. That is 1 to 100 microliter. 1 to 100 microliter. There in the flame atomizer, how much we saw? 0.5 to 1 ml that time i was telling you that microliter is enough so that is why we are saying the flame atomizer is uh, that is the advantage disadvantage of the flame atomizer because you need more sample to study over there to get a good output but here very less concentration is also enough just uh, let me just excuse me for water Thank you. So, this much uh, sample, this much less concentration of the sample is very good enough for the study and it is introduced in the sample cell or holder by inserting the tip of the micro pipette through a port in the outer jacket. Okay. And into the uh, gas inlet. Uh, you can see here this is the sample inlet okay you just see this this one 
is the graphite tube this one is the graphite tube okay so electrothermally this is electrically heated graphite furnace you are just putting your sample inlet through you are just putting your sample of 1 to uh, 100 microliter through the micro pipette micro pipette have you seen the glass pipettes you have seen in your uh, laboratories plus two or bac laboratories you have seen the uh, glass uh, pipettes but micro pipettes that are like uh, small micro tips will be there and through that you can take the sample of uh, micro liter then you can insert it through the sample inlet to that uh, uh, graphite tube to that furnace okay alternatively the powdered analyte sample also can be introduced directly into the graphite tube because the furnace which you are going to use that is very like uh, you don't need any flame but sensitivity is more and your sample solution is very less this is microliter sample solution or your microgram whatever it may be it is good enough to atomize that means simply through heating through the electrically heated graphite furnace we are making it to be in the vapor state then making it to be the atomization is happening okay so the nature and design of the qubits or sample holder is of great importance in this part so the most most important component in gfss is the qubit or sample holder you are using okay so the different type of qubits are commercially available the standard qubit made from electrographite is suitable for the determination of volatile elements such as lead and cadmium now it is lead poisoning study is a emerging area not only lead many many elements this uh, this two three units whatever you are studying are very important topics if you uh, you can use these things in any industries you go in pollution control board if you want to do a job over there you should have this analytical method uh, knowledge uh, wherever you go so this course this program is very good program uh, as far as this basic knowledge is concerned uh, you can uh, know the fundamental things and go for further studies okay so the extended lifetime of qubits can sustain faster heating rate and uh, have longer lifetime and are uh, specifically useful in determination of refractory elements those are having uh, those uh, are uh, require high temperature for the evaporization so the graphite tube is heated by the passage of an electric current to a temperature capable of evaporating the solvent from the solution means you can tune the temperature to the furnace part itself okay you don't have to increase the flame intensity you don't have to do that kind of manipulation you can just tune it accordingly by uh, seeing what kind of sample you are using if it is refractory elements you need more uh, temperature if you are having um, good enough volatile materials volatile elements then you need less temperature then the current is then increased in such a way that initially the sample is passed and then ultimately it is vaporized okay and producing the metal atoms so subsequently the atomizer uh, components are helping the uh, met, uh, helping us to get the metal atoms then only you are you can proceed further like other spectroscopic tools on the other hand a heating cycle 
is also followed okay heating cycle what is that i will just show you the reproducibility hey this one is very important this word reproducibility is very important today i am doing a experiment what do you mean by reproducibility if you are doing a job as a chemist in some uh, analytical industry now it is chemist post uh, is a lot of chemist post is there recently one ntpc chemist post is there and uh, opsc chemist post is there so lot of things are there see our reproducibility is very very important when your senior scientist is telling is it reproducible then you don't know the meaning of reproducibility if you want to detect a sample if you want to detect a water sample where you are having certain elements are there okay today you you have measured by using some spectroscopic method or some different method also there this the, through this program you are going to study various methods analytical methods ph conductivity that are readily available in your plus 2 labs also so uh, while uh, studying that you must uh, listen it very carefully because that is readily available for this kind of method spectroscopic methods are costly methods if your laboratory of your uh, navaratna company is there if you are having some uh, good companies where your facility is there then these are very sensitive and selective very good techniques and accurate spectroscopic methods are accurate ph conductivity metry other things are not that much accurate but you can make it accurate by uh, erroneous free okay but what is this reproducibility is today i am doing i am analyzing some water sample where i am having this this elements in the concentration of detection detection limit getting this this much concentration okay but tomorrow while doing the repeating the same experiment i am not getting the same result same water sample same elements are there but my detection limit i am seeing difference difference in the detection limit then i might have this manual error i might have the manual error so you have to do it very very carefully okay you have to analyze the solutions very very carefully okay so that is what is reproducibility you if i put it in this way to make you understand you remember your plus 2 titration or graduation titration methods you followed you should have got concordant readings concordant readings because the sample whatever you have taken in the burette is then the sample you are taking in the conical flux or beaker that is same okay and uh, uh, you are adding the same amount of your uh, uh, indicators then why your readings will be different until and unless manual errors are there okay concordant reading you must have got concordant readings so that is what is your reproducibility means so for reproducibility the temperatures the time of drying time of your <coughs> assaying <coughs> sorry and atomization process are carefully selected depending on the metal to be analyzed you can't uh, take time like at home you will be cooking okay if 5 minute more some less gravy in the curry will remain but it's okay you can't do that for maintaining for reproducibility for getting similar kind of result with the metal to be analyzed your temperature whatever you are going to maintain your time of drying your time of assaying and your atomization process so be carefully selected this is what is the heating cycle mean heating cycle the temperature uh, temperature you are maintaining for drying okay 
and how much time you must maintain for the drying purpose then slowly you are increasing the asking time okay then you, you are keeping the temperature constant for the asking purpose and the time you are maintaining for the asking purpose that has to be fixed okay and for atomization you need more temperature shooting up in the beginning then you are just maintaining it to be constant and the time you are maintaining for the atomization this cycle must you must maintain for elements to elements for all element it can't be constant but for elements to element you must maintain it so the sensitivity of GFAs is much higher as compared to flame A's and the detection limits are lower by 2 to 3 orders of magnitude than that in the A's. Okay. So you can detect even less amount of your substances there that also can be detected which you are not able to detect in the flame A's also. Okay. So while using this GFAs, the great care is required during the sample preparation because contamination that is arising, going arising due to your glassware or volumetric pipettes. Because the pipettes you are going to use, micro pipettes or glassware you are going to use, the furnace you are going to, the sample inlets are there, it must be clean and good enough. Uh, uh, and the time and temperature you are maintaining should be proper enough. Then only you will be getting the uh, result very good in GFAs as compared to your flame A's. Okay. So the uh, important thing is handling of background absorption. Background absorption means you want to study a absorption of a element. You don't want other noise coming uh, to the picture of that observance okay if my microphone is uh, very clear and if my voice is audible to you then you, you will get a good clarity in that but if some noise sounds are coming while your microphone is on then that are your background absorption so sometimes this handling uh, of background absorption in GFAs is very, very crucial because high background absorption is a problem in the area of furnaces. Everything, every study is having some lacuna also. Okay, you have to rule out that to study something in a good way. So this may be solved by diluting the sample or selecting another resonance wavelength line if your after radiation part okay so the use of matrix modifier is a commonly acceptable method used to reduce background effects in this method a reagent is added to the sample that may modify the matrix behavior and thereby tackle the problem of the background when some additional reagent if you are adding to the sample it may observe the background absorption parts so the sample will not get be affected through that so sometimes added matrix may modify the analyte also so following are the regions for adding matrix modifier it stabilizes the analyte during the uh, ashing stage okay and it converts the interfering matrix into a volatile compound that may be removed during ashing and it helps to obtain isothermal conditions in the graphite tube by delaying the analyte atomization so there are certain advantages and disadvantages with AFGFAs also like the flame A's here also some advantages and disadvantages are there. 
adventus till now you have already uh, noted down that it eliminates the possibility of the interaction of the sample with different components of the flame and thereby eliminating anomalous results okay and less samples will be reaching to the flame uh, sensitivity will be less that things also you are avoiding here the longer residence time for the analyte in the path of the incident radiation leads to greater sensitivity yes this is what is the advantage what is this mean they are you are just spraying the sample then it is reaching up to the flame then atomization is happening then it is uh, radiation it is getting uh, contacted with the incident radiation but here if you remember this one see the sample inlet is there as soon as it is reaching uh, through the inlet here light path light is passing through light is continuously passing through that uh, path okay and graphite furnace graphite tube is uh, ready and it, uh, as soon as the through inlet it is passing within the short time scale it is getting atomized and light is it is coming in contact of the incident light which is the advantage over here that uh, incident light leads to greater sensitivity so for a long time you, the incident it is coming in contact of the incident radiation as soon as it is falling in the sample inlet it is going to the uh, furnace tube and then graphite furnace tube then it's resulting it will result in a greater sensitivity as a higher proportion of the analyte sample is converted into vapors the sensitivity is further enhanced so uh, a sample analyte sample is not getting waste it is not getting waste it is immediately falling on the furnace and get uh, converting into vapors atomization is immediately happening it provides an ability to deal with the very small sample sizes oh it's of course we saw it uh, uh, in the previous uh, text also so this become quite important as far as your clinical samples are concerned because small size you can't have clinical samples in large quantity if you want to study water sample if you want to study some other samples large quantity is possible but clinical samples or biological samples if uh, they are as such costly as well as small quantity only you can take out okay so as far as uh, your if you want to study through as atomic absorption spectroscopy method then gfas is good for the clinical samples however it is also is having some disadvantages that is the background absorption effect is more serious method that is what i was discussing how to handle it then analyte may be lost during the assaying specifically for the volatile compounds for the volatile compounds while doing assaying sometimes the element itself will lost in that process okay sometimes it may happen that is why experiments are experiments you have to do trial and error for that the sample may not be completely atomized also sometimes okay so the precision is poorer than uh, in flame as however furnace auto samplers have uh, enhanced the precision of your furnace as so problems due to interference uh, and background high background also will be there see what do you understand by heating cycle in context of graphite furnace i have already discussed that so in material everything is there for you so coming to the atomic absorption spectrophotometer this unit is very big one uh, so uh, you are having single beam atomic absorption spectrophotometer as well as double beam atomic absorption spectrophotometer 
this is the same way we discussed in the uv visible spectrophotometer if you remember single beam atomic single beam absorption spectrometer and double beam absorption spectrophotometer in single beam what is happening source sample uh, is there then your uh, lamp your hollow cathode lamp is there through which radiation is coming out then here analyte solution and that atomization is happening through flame then in the path here you are having the vaporized atomization uh, atoms you are having so radiation is falling on that then it is getting excited then it is going to the monochromatic unit okay then through monochromator it is getting selected the output you are um, going to get getting up Oh, sorry. Uh, just a minute. Now, okay? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You're audible. So much background noise. This is what is the, about signal and noise ratio and background noise. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Someone has telling. Okay. Mm, let me concentrate on my part. So here the demerit is what? Single beam uh, atomic absorption spectrophotometer, double beam. Double beam we will see. But before that, I'm just telling you what is the demerit over here. If you remember real numbers law, log p0 pi p is equal to epsilon bc means p0 and p you have to take a reference for the reference sample divided by your sample you are just using that so once you have to take here reference sample again another time you have to use the uh, your uh, sample which you want to analyze for the study but double beam spectrophotometer what happens here the double beam of your halo cathode lamp is split by the mirror chopper okay one half passing through the atomizer and the other half around it which is uh, you are seeing here okay other half will be around to the sample so the two beams are then recombined by the half silver mirror and pass through the monochromator. So the ratio between the reference and sample signal is then amplified and fed out to the read out display or recorder. Okay. So here, here you are using a chopper to divide the radiation in two ways. So that is the uh, beauty of this double beam spectro uh, atomic absorption spectrometer. Okay. 
But the modern atomic absorption spectrometer are generally have following features. That is, these have lamp turret capable of holding at least four hollow cathode lamps emitting in absorption line. Just imagine if four lamps are there, then it will enhance the sensitivity and capturing of the many samples can be done at a time. The sample area is capable of incorporating the auto sampler which can work with both flame and furnace atomizer okay and some others are also there okay here since in points it is mentioned you can read of your own also no problem in that monochromator is capable for high resolution typically up to this many nanometer and photo multiplier tubes are uh, function over the range of this so these are some points okay then coming to the interference I, this particular interference i had already discussed many times in the atomic uh, fluorescent spectrometry also i had discussed that is sample interference then spectral interference chemical interference all these things are there so absorption uh, due to molecular species and scatterings are the most problematic things in electrothermal atomization. When scattering thing you have to avoid that is coming through spectral uh, uh, interference because another source of spectral interference is the light scattering or absorption by solid particles or through unvaporized solvent droplets. Some unvaporized solvent droplets also will be there. Some molecular species in flame, in flame itself, some molecular species will be there. That also will interfere with the study. That is your background absorption. Okay. So that is the thing, spectral interference. Then chemical interference is another part of thing. Based on this also, one next SAQ question is there for you that these include interference due to your ionization, formation of uh, low volatility compounds, dissociation, etc. Okay. So during atomization in the flame, uh, why I'm just discussing this part, because in subsequent SFQ, there is a question related to this. So during atomization in the flame, the several reactions occur resulting in the formation of analyte compounds which decrease the atomic population in the cell. So most important chemical interference is due to the anions and form atom of compounds of low volatility from the analyte elements. For example, if I had seen this example, it will be clear. The refractory elements such as your titanium, this, 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 these things and elements like this may combine with OA and OH species in the flame. In flame, they are existing. So producing the thermally stable oxides and hydroxides. That is what is chemical interference. Means some other chemical is also getting formed in between the process which are going to interfere significantly in analysis of the elements. So similarly, the absorbance due to calcium is decreased in presence of phosphate because of the formation of the calcium phosphate having low volatility. Again, low volatility compound is getting formed means it is becoming very, very difficult for studying the calcium alone. Then physical interference. So this may be due to variation in gas flow rate, physical interference. Means you are just changing the flow rate is, if it is uh, uh, less. If changes in the solution viscosity affecting its rate of aspiration of the flame. Okay, If that is what is happening, then you will can say, the uh, physical interference is there. Sample handling. Okay. As far as this application of AS is concerned, 
it is having geological biological environmental industrial and cement sector also marine sediments pharmaceutical so many applications and many kind of samples you can study by using the as and more than 60 elements or at the trace and ultra trace level also can be studied by using <coughs> this as the accuracy in as method is generally limited by random errors and noise to about 0.5 to 5 percent and spectral and chemical interference may however cause systematic errors and precision of as in typical this percentage of observance larger than 0.1 or 0.2 for the flame atomization and 1 to 5 percent for electrothermal atomization here i want to say one thing that every time i tell this detection limit okay is very very important detection limit that is why method to method its sensitivity varies right the detection limit of the AS method lie in the range of PPB and the limits uh, and the GFAS giving better detection limit as compared to the flame AS. Here you can see the detection limits. You see the same silver, same silver, same sample. If you are taking air acetylene flame, the detection limit is 0.9 ppb. Okay. However, if you are taking graphite furnace, you see the detection limit is so good, 0 0.005. Why I am saying so good? If you are not able to understand, you will be seeing, hey, this is 0.9, it is more as compared to this 0 0.005. No, we are not taking about more and less. We are talking about more in uh, number, more in uh, quantity. We are not seeing that. Detection limit. We are discussing detection limit. Man means that if in your sample, even 0 0.005 ppb is present, silver, so small amount even if it is present, this graphite furnace technique atomizer, if you are using, then this is technique you can detect even a small amount of silver however if in the sample 0 0.005 0 0.07 0.1 is also there this air acetylene flame photo uh, atomizer if you are using it will not detect this as instrument will not detect so just imagine how important this atomizer is playing a role over here so here is the detection limit chart zinc you see so uh, like uh, less amount can be detected here every uh, thing you can see this graphite furnace part is having a good detection limit so there are certain oh we came to summary okay the time is also there uh, so merits and uh, limitations of atomic absorption spectrometry. Some of the merits are here. The equipment is very easy to use. How easy? No, it's also difficult because you are, uh, your sampling method is uh, very, very tedious. But uh, okay, it may be easy. If we do the experiment only, we will come to. No, it is a robust technique. The techniques has a small run around the time, moderate cost, low detection limit. And coming to disadvantage, that requirement of furnace for the analysis of uh, refractory elements, then use of flammable gases, non-automated analytical procedures. So now we came to the summary. Okay, so here is the time. Just five minutes for the discussion. Hello. So, uh, 
everyone understood it seems so very good i'm happy then uh, because the flame photometry whatever we discussed in the last class as well as uh, uh, the uh, this one uh, the atomic fluorescence spectrophotometry we had discussed in the last class it is almost similar type uh, that is atomic absorption spectrophotometry because technique the principle is same everywhere here also but here we came to know about since absorption absorption here we talked about that is why we focused on the atomization part we focused on the atomization part mostly that flame atomization as well as your uh, this atomization graphite furnace atomization okay so if no more question then uh, can we hello ha ah, tell ma'am i am ditti ha ah, ditti see see your signal to noise ratio is very high okay. you are in order to in order to reduce that you have to do a experiment by tuning the distance of the mic as well as your mouth okay i am reducing it ma'am yes it reduced a lot i am so reducing the noise ha so sensitivity get enhanced okay okay uh, ma'am i am am i audible now ha uh, yes ma'am so i have a uh, silly doubt uh, because it's uh i am i have uh, some doubt regarding the uh, mono, use of monochromator after mm -hmm. the uh, uh, atomizer uh, vaporize the sample and absorption takes place what is the use of monochromator there hmm. see uh, sometimes what happen i understood your point because you can mute yourself because it is getting okay. noise Uh, some uh, some spectroscopic methods we also use monochromator in the beginning itself after the radiation is passing through uh, means before the sample also we keep monochromator and sometimes uh, the we also keep after the sample also monochromator before and after keeping the monochromator depends on the spectroscopic methods if i want to parse a monochromat monochromatic radiation to the sample then i have to use it before if sometimes what happen due to your spectral uh, interference due to your spectral interference uh, this uh, nazrul here also i am just telling you this uh, ha ha just to both of you i am just uh, uh, answering here interference can be of uh, spectral interference also you can mute yourself can be of chemical interference also so sometimes if we want to avoid the spectral interference due to scattering that is coming out of the sample then we have to put a monochromator after the sample recording we have to keep the monochromator after the sample recording so that a output which is coming out of the sample it will be monochromatic and it will be intense enough to get captured through the detector okay so this spec, uh, i answer to this uh, ditti also that why we are keeping the monochromatic uh, radiation emitted side uh, in order to get uh, avoid the spectral interference due to scattering parts scattering spectral interference i also answer to nazrul that interference how it is handled interference are many types spectral interference i told you now chemical interference also can be handled if you are avoiding the contamination uh, that you are going to get through uh, your furnace or through your micro pipettes you are handling using over there that also can be avoided thank you ma'am thank you thank you uh, ma'am uh, how the monochromator uh, filters the 
uh, the noise over the real signal uh, from the element we desire for okay in order to know that the monochromators uh, i want to say you if today you search in the internet monochromator monochromators are also having different wavelength selectivity okay so if i want suppose i want a monochromatic radiation mani wavelength of specific wavelength right monochromatic radiation of 300 nanometer to pass through then i will be using the monochromator which will allow the 300 nanometer to pass and rest other uh, wavelength radiations it will block okay. if i want my uh, radiation of 400 nanometer to pass on then i can use the 400 nanometer monochromator then other radiation of other wavelengths will block okay okay ma'am it, it will select a particular wavelength. it will select yes because we are not going that detail in the class because of some uh, it is not in your course as i asked you just i answered i am also having with me many monochromators many uh, filters depending our selectivity we can select it. okay okay ma'am so it depends on the analyte uh, analyte uh, Yes. Uh, the nature of analyte. Nature of analyte. The way you are using the radiation source depending on nature of analyte. Here also you can use. You can select the monochromator. The monochromator then it uh, focuses to the detector and uh, we show the observant uh, versus hmm. concentration plot. Yes. So for today, I am just closing here. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, all of you. Bye. Good luck, ma'am. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.